be able to start the meeting. And you're good. Hey, good afternoon. Hello and welcome to our second webinar on digital uh, talent. Today we're focusing on building a culture where, where digital professionals can thrive in government. For those joining for the first time, welcome. My name is Ari Hirschberg and I'm the manager of digital community engagement at the Exchange Lab. My pronouns are he or him. I have pale skin and an oval face and a shaven head. I'm wearing a green shirt today. The territorial acknowledgement. I am joining you today from the beautiful Victoria, British Columbia, where I'm grateful to work and play on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen peoples. Uh, known, today, known today as the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanic peoples, whose historical relationship with the land continues to this day. So a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this is recorded and shared with an internal and external audience. You can turn on live captions at the top of your screen with the three ellipses and more buttons to click find it. As you can see, we use MS Teams Live, so, ask, so to ask questions of both those questions you love, and we'll be filtering those into our conversation. So like, start asking questions as soon as you have them, and we'll be tallying them, um, and the tops will uh, get answered first. We don't answer all the questions because we only have so much time, so we followed up with a podcast uh, later in the month uh, with any of the questions that we don't get to. At the end of the session, you'll receive a survey. Uh, apologies, it somehow came in earlier this morning. Um, so you should have received the survey already. So if you could fill it out, I will also put the link of the survey up at the end. Um, these surveys really help us. Like um, this uh, second session for digital talent came from the survey responses from the first one. Um, so if there's more things that we can go forward in this, please tell us and we will do our best to put it out there for you. So. Uh, in December 2021, I received a case study uh, building digital government talent pipelines from Code of Canada in my inbox. I found myself nodding along as I read the case study. Um, Dorothy Eng, the executive director of Code for Canada, Jonathan Kraft, founder of Policy Ready, and Jordan Samus, um, senior director of digital talent and uh, data divisions. Uh, we're going to discuss, uh, we're using the case study to start the first one and now go further and talk about some of the things they found uh, and answer questions uh, about this work. It's really fascinating. Um, and so even after the first one, we knew there was more to cover. So today we were offering the second conversation. The focus on this conversation is what does it look like to build a culture where digital professionals can thrive in government? And I'm happy to welcome back this time Dorothy Yang and Jordan Samus to continue the conversation. Thanks for both. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. Likewise. It's fun. It's uh, so digital live stream podcast, second digital live stream. Here we go. To you first, Dorothy, what are some of the key differences in practice uh, between digital and non digital ways of working, and how might we address some of these? Um, so, um, there, there are there are a lot of different uh, differences between you know digital and non digital. I think um, maybe to, to start off, just broadly speaking, uh, you know there's the uh, interpretation of digital around you know digitization, maybe taking paper based processes, things that are analog, things that are always printed, and like you know you think of fax machines or like. Kind of like the old the old way of doing things and then dig and then versus the digital era which we live in now which is you know taking things from paper based into some digital or virtual format um that's you know i think surface level uh interpretation of of the term digital i think more importantly what um when it comes to humans and teams working in digital environments or approaching problems in a digital way, it is really about um, changing mindsets. Um, it's about um, uh, understanding, uh, first starting with, from a set, from a place of, uh, of empathy and understanding and self-compassion, like understanding that, you know, you might not have all the answers. You might have a lot of assumptions in your head as to who your users are, um, you know, what your users might need and what, what they might think. Um, but then also giving yourself the uh, freedom and and that and that self compassion to realize like well actually maybe I'm I'm not right and so in order to 
Um, and, and so from here, you know, validating that by actually getting out of the room, you know, talking to users, um, re really trying to like test test and, and invalidate your own assumptions that maybe have long been, you know, sitting sitting in your head and you've been working off of um, on like day to day or within your project. So um, I think that is uh, fundamentally the difference between digital and non-digital is really about mindset. It's, you know, fixed mindset versus growth mindset. It's like, um, you know, no being uh, assuming that you kind of know, know things and, and you're and you don't need to test those assumptions versus being curious and being like, well, wait a minute, like where did those assumptions come from? What what series of events or my own lived experiences brought me here to this point of privilege that um, that uh, that I'm not I'm not really like, you know, unpacking a bit and I've just kind of been assuming up till now. So um, I'd say, yeah, that's that's the big that's the big fundamental piece. But uh, I'll, I'll set that as a jumping off point and maybe. <laughs> Flip it over to back to you, Ari, or over to you, Jordan, to, to build on that. I, I like you, that you said curious. Uh, I'm sure we'll come back to that word many times. Uh, Jordan. Yeah, I think I, maybe just uh, I, I really liked Dorothy's framing of that there is sometimes folks think of digital as like, how do I take some existing process or some existing service and, and take it from paper and put it into to the internet? Um, which is not necessarily changing the thing, it's just changing the method of the thing. Um, and then also just a different perspective, <clears throat> how you approach work. And so I think the thing for me that, that rings true is that while the technology is advanced, the complexity of our world and the complexity of our users is also changed. And so I think when I think about, you know, the theme of our session about building a culture where digital professionals can thrive, I'm thinking about well, what's the existing culture that was there at the start and how to and where are we moving towards? Um, and what would be some of the reasons for the existing culture to be the way it is? Um, and so if you think of, I think just about the last few decades, just the speed in which um, things are changing, the types or diversity of users of service. Um, so the volume, the diversity of that is changing, the speed in which those new needs are coming about, the speed in which organizations or services need to respond to them is only increasing. And so I think that's necessitating that curious approach or that empathetic approach that Dorothy was mentioning. And on one hand, it it's feels like a almost a more moral way of doing work and a, like a, just a better way of approaching work. But I think there's also just a business rationale there. You know, you have lots of companies in the private sector that um, do the, this work in this way because it is more effective just just purely to 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 provide their service or meet a need. So um, I think that external environment in which this work is happening is a huge driver to the different ways the culture works and it's um, exposing, I'd say, some of the challenges with traditional way of works or slow moving um, cultures that we've, we've experienced in the public sector. Thanks. I'd like to go deeper. I think we can go deeper with a bit of all this. So, so Jordan, so what about perception of risk management around this work? Yeah, and so I think that, that's a great one because I think um, one of the things that, you know, a culture or a practice piece, I think that that, get, that uh, digital teams within public sector often bump up against is, you know, like, give me your three year plan team and your, 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 your 10 year roadmap. Um, or, you know, funding agency is like, okay, give me your three year plan of how you're going to do this and every milestone and every deliverable you're going to have. And, and that doesn't match the nature of the work because often you have to just probe, sense, learn, iterate, like, and you will continuously move towards build to achieving some sort of outcome. Um, but to me, that kind of comes back with a sense of that the desire for that plan or that is, is rooted in some sort of sense of like risk management. I have to make sure we won't do the wrong thing. Um, and so um, part of, I think, our, our job in kind of bursting the bubble of digital transformation is helping those decision makers understand that actually iteratively, iterative ways of working is a form of risk management because by continuous delivery of value, you can make pivots shorter uh, and you can waste less and avoid the like, I'm certain it's good, it's good, it's good. Oh my gosh, it's a failure and we've wasted $100 million. 
um, that experience. So I think um, that drive for certainty or that drive for managing risk often creates an anti-pattern. Your thoughts, Dorothy? Yeah, and I mean, I think I agree with everything, Jordan, you said, and, and even to elaborate on, on that further and even zo zoom, zoom out a bit, um, is that like, um, you know, we we are at Code for Canada, we're a national nonprofit, mission driven, you know, dedicated to, uh, you know, helping governments to um, deliver services that are more equitable, accessible, inclusive, you know, just generally serve everyone. Um, uh, meet, meet people where they're at. And so when we look at that kind of vision or mission uh, as Code for Canada, and we look at the public service and governments across Canada, um, those missions are very much aligned, right? Like we, we all want every person in Canada to have access to the services that they need and they deserve. Um, if, if that is the overall uh, goal or vision or mission um, of, of government teams, um, then it's it's worth actually um, breaking down what what is risk then like if, if you know if we think about risk risk being you know likely some kind of uncertainty or very a variety of uncertainties that uh, material materially affect a team's ability or a group's ability to um, achieve its objectives or achieve those goals then actually defining risk from a, a more holistic perspective um, changes the way that um, we might actually, like governments might actually look at planning. So, you know, when you're um, going into these like 12 month, multi-year planning uh, roadmaps, they're, they're layered with a bunch of assumptions, right? That, um, you know, is are, are, uh, are fine to make at, at a point in time, but um, with those assumptions, every, every multi, you know, every every timeline or plan comes with a bunch of uncertainty or risk that whether you acknowledge it or not through, oh, we planned this 12 month roadmap and we've we've thought of all the different things that can happen. Um, it's it's quite unlikely that 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 uh, any team or any individual is capable of thinking of every single kind of risk that can affect, you know, the rollout of, of a plan and the plan will always change. Um, so I think there's um, going back to like the uh, risk perspective, like in in a lot of um, digital service environments or digital service teams that we work with within governments, um, you know, there's a lot of we actually work with a lot of um, groups that we find are have a very strong um, sense of risk within government of like, you know, uh, this service needs to meet these four criteria. Um, by by this kind of timing, or you know, this delivery delivery must be met by this date. Um, versus, as you kind of layer in, you know, all these risks, and you're planning around them, and you're planning the processes around them. Are our teams actually keeping in mind that broader goal of like better services for everyone? Like, did anyone ha have people actually gone out of the building to talk to users who are the actual? Um, that that's the objective, right? Of making equitable, more accessible services and understanding, well, what's the risk if if we layer on a bunch of processes or design in a bunch of deliverables that don't actually hit the end user, what's the risk there, right? That that we're um, not accounting for. Um, you know, is the public um, being able to interact with our services? Are they able to provide us with feedback? Um, there's a there's a there's a often we find that government teams, are really good at quantifying and um, defining risks that are more internal to them, but less. Uh, it's it's harder to define and actually quantify the risks that that are out of their control, right? The ones that how what is the public's perception of public service or or government services and whether they're able to access them or not, or if they're serving them their needs and and all, and all that. So. Um, yeah, I think risk is really interesting because the, in general, you know, we hear about governments being super they're, they're risk averse. They, they have quite sophisticated risk management, um, uh, you know, frameworks and, and policies and procedures internally. Um, yet there's still this large disconnect from what we see with with um, the, the uh, lack of understanding of, of how um, maybe risks associated with public perception don't necessarily fall within that um, that planning um, internally within governments. 
Jordan, do you have anything to share on that one? Yeah, I was just going to add, I think, because I think this one is a good one that strikes at some, you know, some real lived experiences of where that digital, non digital, um, maybe that's a f false binary, but where these kind of areas clash a bit is um, sometimes I feel like digital ways of working sometimes get the reputation, or at least within the public sector, as kind of like you would know, talk about, you know, teams that are working, say, in an agile scrum fashion, as kind of like, um, undisciplined or uh, well they just you know they just do a little bit and they kind of um, they just adapt to their environment or they're not as rigorous as their risk management um, in a more traditional sense trying to express kind of just like the wild west kind of kind of feeling um, and I, I've, I've heard that sometimes and I think what it what we what's true actually is that actually those teams are actually very disciplined um, and they're very disciplined in figuring out the scope of the work that is actually achievable, delivering value, but also discipline in including, as to Dorothy mentioned, like user experience and user feedback into driving their service delivery. Um, and so sometimes I think I also hear, I guess, that on particular, uh, particularly on user experience, sometimes I, I kind of hear uh, a narrative around like it's a nice to have piece um, it's maybe a piece that can take your product or service from a state of neutral to a state of like very good, but we don't talk about it as like a, um, even a tool for risk management of making sure it's not going from like what we think it is and actually it's actually down here and it's bad and all of a sudden now it's in the papers. Um, and so, you know, I was having one conversation recently where we kind of said, well, what if we actually frame doing user experience as a risk management strategy? Because it's a way to check that your 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 you know your policy intent is actually being delivered on the ground, um, that people are actually doing the thing that you the way you wanted it, um, that that you're actually achieving the outcome that you'd like to do. So I think there's a great way um, that that's a that's a tool I think we can use to help drive the um, value for user experience, which I think is a is a cultural barrier we run into. I would I would just like to say I love that idea <laughs> and if anything the this series of events we always seem to like start something and then it like, kind of rolls into another builds momentum um, into something else and I'm I'm really digging this like you know user experience user research as a risk management um, tool because because perhaps it's the um, Lang like you know a lot of things come down to language and how people and people's perceptions of certain terms and, and language and terms like you know digital user research user experience design um at least in our work at code for canada a lot of um you know um public service teams that have that have been working in this space for a long time aren't really familiar with those terms and so um, when you when you bring in terms like that, it's like a bit it might be a bit hard for them to understand. Well, how does that fit with the mental models that I already have of my work, which are often very much, you know, um, embedded with like risk management. So anyways, I'm, I'm, I'm into it, Jordan. We should figure out maybe what <laughs> go, go further with that at some point. Yeah, uh, I really like that. I hadn't heard that before either. Uh, idea for risk management through service design. It's another great topic. Um, a couple, uh, oh, I was asked, uh, I see a lot of questions that are coming up on the uh, Q&A. If you like something on it, please upvote it because we'd like to pick the highest voted ones uh, once we finish a couple of our questions. Uh, but to the next point is, is I thought some fallacy of planning. Jordan, you already started talking about that a little bit already. Yeah, and I think it's, um... For me, it's it's around. So not not to say. So I think there's a, sometimes a false certainty that we have in planning, or that the outcomes of our plans will come to fruition in the way we thought they were would. And so um, it's very much connected to I think our risk conversation about well, you know, what's that three year plan? What is that ten year plan? Um, I was watching an old episode of West Wing the other day, and I remember the, the this is slightly dating myself, but the president was talking about he, he had to review a 10 year budget thing. And he's like, has that ever come true? And he's like, not once, Mr. President. And, and he's like, but you legally have to still do it. So, um, but we experienced that, I think, in the public sector. And, and for good reason, we, we, we need to, be, you know, the public sector has to be 
a pillar of continuity in our communities and a, and a stabilizing force. Um, it's part of the reason for it to exist. So having certainty, having planning, and, and that structure worked for many, many years, hundreds of years. Um, but I think it's just recognizing that we have to be honest with how often do the plans we create actually unfold in the way we thought they would, and then how much workload is going into the planning effort versus doing the work. And so I think when you kind of get that tipping point where you know, the certainty of the planning is no longer, it's not yielding good results anymore. You know, if we're looking beyond six months to a year, sometimes, you know, look back at the last three years, five years of our own lives, um, how certain were we with and with many of the experiences we've had. Um, so I think part of it is, is, is surfacing that of like how, how accurate is the planning and how do we want to invest resources and how do we have effective governance along the way so that we can make sure that the concerns of not having that long-term plan um, are mitigated in other ways. Dorothy, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, um, I agree again, everything Jordan that you said, like I think, uh, you know, that like famous quote by like famous saying by like Mike Tyson, you know, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. <laughs> Um, that's pretty much like that sums it up, right? Like, um, every, every buddy, every team, every organization can create a plan, um, that, that is based on a bunch of assumptions, but until as time moves on, those assumptions almost always get invalidated. Um, and so plans need to change. And so more importantly, um, as, as, you know, uh, uh, aligning with what Jordan just said is like it's less about the all of the time and resources invested to create that perfect plan but really about the process to uh, respond to changes right to to be to respond with agility and and change course as our assumptions change and, and as we learn new things along the way um, and I mean I would the one thing I would I would challenge though is that while I think in, in some circles of, you know, our society, there is a perception that maybe, you know, government is, plays a role that, you know, creates plans and sticks to them. And those plans are good plans or they're good enough or whatever. And they, they government manages to deliver through with them. Um, that might've been a time and place, but I would say in general, like the, the, the vibe you kind of get across you know, not just Canada, but but the world across the world, especially coming out of COVID, is um, you know the largely that uh, there's a growing distrust in government that governments don't really stick to their plans. A lot of and you know governments when we when we think about the public and they think about government, often it, yeah it, it isn't fair, but they do lump in like you know politicians with the public service and into one giant. Um, you know, bucket, but uh, whereas there, those are two very distinct um, areas of government. Um, maybe one of those sides is making the promises and maybe, you know, laying out some plans versus the other side is in, um, is, is responsible more for, for implementing those. But from the public's perspective, um, you know, government is government. And so every time a plan is communicated to the public and then it's not really adhered to, um, that that distrust slowly starts to grow, right? And um, you know, while that's there's growing sentiment like that across the general public, like I think a lot of if if we think about where we've come as a country, like a lot of our marginalized communities, you know, underserved communities, those are the ones really where distrust is the highest, right? Because um, plans may have been promised or or things may have been promised, and those have changed quite quite a lot um, for for those kinds of groups. So. Yeah, I think it it is um, this uh, that the the planning fallacy is real. Um, you know, it, there's a there's a lot of uh, hope I think people have in planning and and like setting plans and sticking to plans. But I think more importantly, what is um, what what people value is um, seeing governments being able to respond to change, right? Um, and, and we saw evidence of that when when COVID started and the pandemic hit and and. Um, you know, the government of Canada was was quite quick at responding to, you know, rolling out um, CERB and, and, and various benefits and wage subsidies very quickly. Um, and so that's when we saw, you know, kind of the, the, uh, the hope in governments across the public 
kind of, kind of shot up because they were able to like respond with agility to certain um, current events at the time. So. Okay, uh, looking in the questions, which we'll head over to shortly, um, I'm going to go with this because it seems to hit a lot of the questions, some of the questions as well. Uh, effective teams built on psychological safety and trust. Uh, Jordan. Sorry, Ari, can you repeat the question? Uh, yes. Um, effective teams built on psychological safety and trust, uh, the difference between digital and non-digital ways of working. Right. Um, so I think the um, for and I think effective digital culture to exist, there has to be kind of has to start at the team level um, and for there to be safety within the team for multiple different perspectives um, to be to work or to be shared um, on, on any given thing. Um, and so part of that is that continuous learning kind of dynamic of that team and being able to share what's working, what's not working, um, where we failed, those type of things. Um, historically, I think we have had a culture where failure is not talked about. Um, it's kind of, you know, it's the other F word. Um, it could be kind of seen as career limiting or um, um, something that you you would um, just not share. It, would, it, would, it was, and we see that, and you see that in many different places and you see it, um, stymie continuous improvement or continuous um, development in many places so for i think there's a role there from a kind of a culture piece as far as especially from a leader's perspective of um whether that be like a product owner or a leader in, in whatever sense or just a leadership trait on a team of uh, creating that that safe space for the team to share and uh, doing that through continued practice so um uh, of demonstrating that vulnerability um, with the team, maybe sharing um, those failures that they've they've experienced or they've done that has happened, demonstrating that that with the team, uh, and then continuously creating that space for the team to to do that. I think if you don't have that bedrock of that like inspection and that that sharing and that safe place to do so, um, it kind of will undermine that continuous improvement nature of your team, which undermines kind of the engine for an all working. Your thoughts, Dorothy? Yeah, like all, all of that and building on, you know, that and tying it back to that um, that uh, risk management piece that we were talking about earlier. Like if there is a perception at an individual level that, you know, if I make a mistake, um, e even subtly in the back of their in the back of their minds, you know, they're kind of connecting their, their subconscious is just like quickly connecting dots of like, oh, if I send this out without, you know, if I, and I made these mistakes, um, then X, Y, Z will happen, right? Understanding the consequence of that. And that's all um, kind of pre-wired from lived experience, from like being in that culture, especially in a culture that is like risk averse, that is like, um, you know, fear of failure as, as Jordan's saying. So um, all of these, uh, these subtle things contribute to the cycle of, um, of, uh, of like further fear of further fear of fear of failure, like kind of you know scared to like harder to acknowledge the reality of like what is continuous improvement and continuous learning actually look like when you know an individual uh, it might have like negative consequences if they make certain missteps. Um, so that idea of you know psychological safety and trust um, begins with that assumption that you know mistakes are okay in fact they are um they're 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 encouraged um you know it, rewarding um, um folk and incentivizing folks for trying new things trying new approaches um seeing what happens and then learning from that and sharing those learnings with others um and i i agree jordan that like that really does have to come at the top level um like being able to see a senior leader uh, approaching their work with some openness and curiosity sets a very strong tone for the rest of the team to uh, to also work in that way. So, um, yeah, I, I do I do think that uh, you know all of these concepts that we've been talking about, like digital and non digital, and how that applies to risk management and and planning and um, you know testing assumptions and being open to to uh, having your assumptions invalidated. 
um, really it all gets grounded in in whether the culture and the environment fosters like trust and um, yeah and and safety as an individual to be able to kind of like put put yourself out there. So Dorothy, we have our first question. I have a few questions I want to ask to, to that one. Uh, the first one is from Beth. Culture is notoriously hard to measure or even sense if progress is happening. What indicators should uh, teams be looking for to know if they are making progress there? That, that's a good question. Um, uh, I think that there are there's so there's so I'm not a, I'm, I'm not a uh, you know organizational behavior specialist so I wouldn't know all that there's probably like a bunch of very um, uh, tangible heuristics or metrics that that you could look at to to look at culture and and you know the kind of a, a, a healthy culture of an organization I think a good place to start for any team um, because I think most importantly it's about monitoring it like it isn't really about like, okay, are you A plus, are you A, are you even an F? Like it's it's hard to um to to like say, well, this culture for this team, you know, they're they rank here in the scale. Um but but I think for all teams, what is more important is about actually starting to track what uh collecting like heuristics and data points as to what is informing the the kind of culture of an, of a team or an organization. So a good example of what um, we do at Code for Canada that is, um, a, you know, a, a pillar of a lot of agile teams are doing team retrospectives. Um, those are just, you know, open forums, usually across a, sm a small group, a small project team that's been working on the same project, um, and uh, and it's, you know, kind of always the same framework of like what went well this week, what didn't go well, or what did, what did you like, what did you long for, what did, what did you lack? You know, there's, there's different kind of retro frameworks. Um, but in that, um, that venue, assuming you have, you know, uh, psychological safety and trust, um, individuals can start to share, you know, the things that they've noticed were blockers for them this week, or what, what made them frustrated, or what made them happy? What did they consider as wins, right? Like all of those things based on the prompts in, in a retrospective start to inform a picture of what is the culture of a team. And then as the team goes through challenges together, you know, they're going through deliverables or milestones or whatever, they're going to learn together and those will all get captured in that same kind of retrospective um, environment if you're doing it consistently. And so I think that that is uh, well, I don't know kind of the exact metrics that you you would always want to look for in every team because every team also is different. Um, at least the um, that kind of monitoring through a through a thing like retrospectives could help a leader of of a team to be able to start to understand well what is the culture and how do we now ha now that we know the culture how do we start to change it and what are the little things we can try here and there. Thank you for that. Um... Jordan, do you want me to reread the question? No, I, I think I got it here. Um, yeah, I think I, I would just echo um, some of what Dorothy said, but I think the biggest thing, you know, I agree with the, com with the framing um, of the question that it is hard to measure because culture is kind of generally not a, like a thing. It's this kind of, um, you know, it's almost like in the air. Um, and so I think the better thing to look at is practices. And, and as Dorothy mentioned, like doing, doing retrospective, but it's observing, I think observing the behaviors within the team is probably just one of your best things to look at. And so as a team, I think you can um, think about what are the behaviors that are really important for you. A great starting point might be just the Agile, you know, the 12 principles and then the Agile Manifesto um, or the BC government looking at our digital principles that are entrenched in our core policy, uh, which we're very much aligned. Um, you know, so are we, you know, are we working in the open? What are our practices around that? Um, are we taking an ecosystem approach? Um, so how are we including that in our decision making as a team to, to create space to make sure that we're taking an ecosystem approach? Um, and I think there's a role too for our Scrum Masters in, in that too, and to create space to, to, to be a bit of that team 
this probably might not be the right word, but like ethnographer in a way of of observing kind of of those behaviors and then not calling out and reinforcing them of like the the positive behaviors that you want to see. Um, and I think that's also a role again for the leader to keep emphasizing and championing and recognizing over and over again and probably overly so the behaviors of the practice you'd like to see. Um, and I think it's one of those things where it's maybe hard to measure, but it's not, it's something that you can feel. And so you kind of get those reports of when you've been on that good team and it's just, it's working well. Those practices are there and you can feel it working well. And when it's not, you surely feel it too. Um, so maybe it's tapping a little bit into that intuitive um, understanding of it versus something that can be, you know, as granular measured. Yeah, I like what I like what you're saying about intuitive. It's like you just really feel it with your team and the connections. Second question from our audience. Are we doing enough to help all public servants gain the skills needed to incorporate digital into their work? Uh, and do you have a case study where we've succeeded in helping upskill versus hire from afar? Uh, Jordan. I think the honest answer is no. Um, we we haven't done enough. Um, and um, I think it's just important to to to, know, to own that. Um, but I think, you know, I think there's a challenge that uh, um, almost every public sector organization and even large organization is just running to in uh, across the world. And we have many different, I don't know what, five or seven different uh, generations in the workforce right now. Um, so you have many people that are coming from uh, from different work histories. Um, they might have different kind of baseline skill sets or different early education experiences that are now brought them into the workforce. Um, so I think the, I don't think we have, we have done enough um, to invest and kind of catch up. Um, case studies where we've succeeded in helping upskill versus higher. Um, I think there's, uh, yes, I mean, I, I, I don't want to, um, I'm thinking more about individuals in my mind and I probably for their, I don't have their, maybe I'm not sure I have their permission to share their story, but um, I, I'm thinking about some of the folks that really have taken, um, have kind of recognized that environment and have, have engaged in significant reskilling and upskilling to, to, to change career path because they uh, were frustrated by that, that government experience or they, um, thought it was a better way. Um, so I definitely have a few cases in mind. Um, and I think there's um, a difference often, I'll maybe just add in the things maybe we don't do well enough that we should attend to is calling out maybe the difference between upskilling and reskilling. I think we often kind of conflate the two. And so there are, there as we think, think about digital transformation, there's I think times where we will need to help people change careers which is a much bigger and different thing than um, add digital skill sets to an existing discipline. Um, you know, for instance, I want to add um, user experience to my any any service. I want to add data capabilities um, to being a policy analyst. Um, those are adding some some skill sets, but not necessarily changing your job. I think we need to call those things out too and do a better job of supporting both. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, your thoughts, Dorothy? Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, maybe I'll be a little more hopeful from Jordan that I feel like, you know, when when we, we, we as Code for Canada, we kind of have the privilege of talking to a lot of different government teams. And what's, what is hopeful is that uh, uh, from our perspective, uh, a lot of um, a lot of governments are seeing the need to invest in training for, for digital skills uh, for for their staff, and so while that you know probably what you're you're right, Jordan, is that it's not widespread enough. You know, it's maybe that that um, the folks being able uh, who have the opportunity to do that training might be a drop in the bucket in, in, when you look at it at the large scale. Um, uh, but I th I think what is what we have noticed and and as an observation across a lot of these digital training or upskilling or reskilling kinds of programs within the public service is uh, is going back to that like thing we talked about at the very beginning of like digital being really about like a mindset change as opposed to just like, you know, a three hour workshop that you sit in, maybe you you try some user research frameworks, let's say for example, and 
you think, okay, now I'm going to go in my job and or everybody in this class is going to go into their day jobs and use the same framework that we just used. And it's going to be pretty, you know, like dust hands off. We've done our work. Um, it, it is, it's, it's quite difficult, right? Once you're out of the classroom and, and trying to apply those learnings in, in, in actual day-to-day -day work. And um, I think what it is, is it's less about um, to, to make those kinds of changes stick. It is less about the training that happens in a classroom, but more of like what what kind of how, how do we make almost like people's individual like operating systems change and and stick right for for a longer term? And how does that then apply to their day to day work as opposed to just doing the one off training and, and, and hoping for the best that people apply that um, outside of the classroom? Um, and uh, we so we've been learning from these experiences and and have uh, in our work at Code for Canada have been, you know, migrating a bit more to kind of like a, a coaching or like a co-development model where, you know, um, it takes it takes people kind of with the skills and experience or, or that kind of, you know, those digital ways of working, sitting shoulder to shoulder with folks maybe who aren't as familiar and they're working together. Um, you know, working on projects together. So they're kind of modeling the behaviors of these new, these changes they want to see within the team or within the organization. Um, and uh, that that seems to stick around a bit longer, like th those kinds of skills when they're um, when they're delivered in more of an experiential learning kind of environment, um, uh, which is good. And so so I think there's uh, there's opportunities to kind of rethink how how training happens and what the right kind of training is. Um, as well, when we think about, you know, are, are people in the public service getting enough digital training? You know, generally, no. And then also, what's the format that, that, is, um, that is ideal that is going to make those changes stick and, and change that kind of mindset in the long term? Thanks, Dorothy. Maybe. Oh, go ahead. Go. We have, yeah, I was just going to add, add, and I know we probably won't have enough time to tackle another question here. So, um, is I, I would say I definitely am deeply hopeful, um, Dorothy. I think uh, I'm just recognizing. I think yeah, you know, speaking openly and truthfully to the audience, that I think we aren't doing enough, but we do, we need to do more, and I think we are starting to do more. Um, and I, I agree with you too of that kind of like what's the right training type of training because I think also we have to look at training um, in how do you create different learning opportunities, but then also create effective um, motivation within an organization and opportunity for them to apply it and, op and not just in a project sense, but in a continual way. Like those are the ways I think we're going to have to start busting the norms um, of, of kind of this is the normal way of doing work. Of course you would have user experience like that's just why are we even talking about it? Um, that's I think where we need to get to, um, but we're not there yet. But I think we can't just do training without attending to those systemic pieces um, about how we organize our team, career paths, um, a whole bunch of those other things. And I noticed there's a couple questions there which we'll hopefully explore more, but the BC government is working towards making some changes um, and creating some more opportunities in those systemic things to go along to, to create some of the more of the conditions that allow the practices to actually happen. Um, and maybe we'll explore those more in the podcast, sorry. Thank you for the nice closing uh, remarks on that. And yes, we have some great questions that we will cover in the podcast in the future. Thank you, Dorothy, and thank you for Jordan for joining us. And thank you, audience, for participating and asking some great questions. And we will keep it going. Have a good day, everyone. Great. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.